Hey, everybody. We're just about ready now to get started with the next uh, part of the program, the Student Scholarship Panel, which I'm honored to, uh, to moderate. And I'm also honored to introduce uh, these three bright, young, rising animal law scholars to my left. And I really enjoyed reading your papers, by the way. So thank you for that and for all your hard work. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, introduce our three speakers, uh, give you the titles of their uh, talks, and then they're each going to get up, give a presentation, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. So uh, our first uh, presenter is Spring Gaines. Spring is in her third year at Loyola University, New Orleans. I love New Orleans. Uh, as a 1L, she spearheaded the reinstatement of an animal legal defense fund chapter to the school. I had to do the same thing when I, so props for that. And she's now uh, serves as its president for the third consecutive year. Uh, she additionally, she volunteers with the Animal Legal Defense Fund as a social media ambassador through the uh, ROAR program. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's the Remote Online Advocacy Representatives Program. So you all should be familiar with that, hopefully. Uh, Spring also serves as vice president of the Environmental Law Society, content editor of the Loyola Current, a law blog produced by the Loyola Maritime Law Journal, and is a member of the Black Inn of Phi Delta Phi International Legal Honor Society. At Loyola, Spring continues to use her scientific background and passion for the natural world in her chosen law concentration. And the focus of her studies is in environmental and animal policy, where she aims to graduate with her certificate in environmental law. I did that too, so props for that. And Spring's paper is Taking a Peck Out of Protection. Change in interpretation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act spells trouble for birds affected by industry. Our second speaker is Tess Vickery. Tess is a policy advisor to the Honorable Emma Hurst, MLC, an elected member of the Australian Animal Justice Party. Tess is also a recent graduate of the Animal Law LLM program at Lewis and Clark Law School, where she was an associate editor of the Animal Law Review, participated in the Animal Law Clinic, and worked as a research assistant to Dr. Raj Reddy. Prior to completing her Animal Law LLM, Tess was an attorney in Sydney, Australia, specializing in commercial and class action litigation, working on notable cases such as Volkswagen Dieselgate class action. And during this time, Tess also established a pilot animal law program, which enabled lawyers at her firm to provide pro bono assistance on animal law cases. And Tess's paper is entitled, A Taxonomy of Class Actions for Animals in the United States. And it's uh, going to be published in the upcoming Animal Law Review, which is great. And last but not least, we have Mary Walsh. Uh, Mary's entering her third year at Cleveland Marshall School of Law at Cleveland State University. Uh, she's been working in cancer clinical research for 12 years. Uh, which she still maintains during the day, wow, uh, while attending law school in the evening. That's very impressive. She chose to return to school to pursue a career in animal law. Mary has been the president of the CM Law Student Chapter of the Animal Legal Defense Fund for the last two years and is the chief managing editor of the Cleveland State Law Review. And her paper is entitled Feeding Fido, the Case for Restitution in Ohio Animal Cruelty Convictions. So I believe our first speaker up is Spring. So with that, I will pass the mic on over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Once again, my name is Spring Gaines. I am a 3L at Layla, New Orleans. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you today. My paper is based on the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Now, before entering law school, I worked as an educator at Marie Mellon Rehab Center in Gulf, Mississippi. We used to bring down students to the Gulf Coast to learn about different species and the animals live in the water and in the air. I would talk to people from the Park Service and amateur bird watchers about what's happening along our Gulf Coast. And every year, I'd be told that the number of birds have been decreasing. So I thought, this is an opportunity from a law perspective to learn about what's happening along our Gulf Coast. Real quickly, give you a rundown of what we're talking about today. Birds are super important not only from an ecological standpoint, but also an economic standpoint. And there is an act protecting birds in the United States called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the MBTA. Within the MBTA, there's a definition of take. Now, take can be seen as the killing of a bird. And we have two different definitions of take. We have deliberate and we have incidental. My focus is on incidental take. In aviation and maritime, we have five different industry players in incidental take. We have bird strikes, communication towers, a seabird bycatch, oil spills and wind turbines. I'll investigate with you guys the impacts of birds in these industries. But since 2017, it's been a different take 
on the word take in our government. And I'll talk about the future implications of this new definition. Now, as I mentioned, I have worked as an educator. I've been told that our rural populations are dwindling. So, in recent headline news, we've been seeing this. That since 1970, we've had a reduction of 3 billion birds in the United States and Canada, 29%. With my knowledge, I thought, is this depressing? <laughs> yes, yes it is. But is it surprising? No, no it isn't. But this is not the first time that here in the United States we've seen declines in bird populations. We saw it at the advent of the MBTA. If, for birds, though, they are such an important part of our ecosystems. From an economic standpoint, we have bird watching, birding, which is a tremendous industry for the United States. When you think about our migratory bird trails, where I'm in Louisiana, we're along the Mississippi Flyway. The flyway is a highway for birds. There are four different ones in the US. We have Atlantic, Central, Mississippi, and Pacific. In Louisiana, we see over 300 species of birds pass through during spring migrations. And we see bird watching opportunities in, in where I am in southeast Louisiana and up to north. People travel along these migration trails. There's pop-up businesses. They generate over billions of dollars in economy just from these activities. But it's not just the economic standpoint that makes birds important. It's their ecological standpoint. Birds provide e ecosystem services such as pest control, they spread seeds, they're pollinators. But they're also sentinel species. The activities of birds, their behavior, their changes in migration, tell us what's happening in our ecosystem. We knew this back in 1962 when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, showing the effects of DDT on bird populations and their eggs. This was the advent of the environmental movement. So in the 1970s, we had these new acts, the Endangered Species Act, helping to protect animals. But way back when we were noticing things, back in the early 1900s, we didn't have such acts protecting animals. And that's the first time we saw that birds were in danger. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was severe decline in bird populations through an economic standpoint. In ladies' fashion, I know it's an odd topic, but if you see movies like Titanic and My Fair Lady, you see these giant plumes of feathers in women's hats. This was a huge industry for hunters and poachers. They hunt birds to the edge of distinction just to gather their feathers and sell them for ladies' fashion. And, come, and organizations like the uh, National Audubon Society were first founded because of decimations in bird populations in the early 1900s. Now, the first act we saw trying to defend birds was the Lacey Act, which prohibited the selling of game birds across state lines. This was state jurisdiction. But state jurisdictions are hard because each state has this different set of laws. We needed something on a federal basis, and that was the weeks mclean Migratory Bird Act which banned the spring shooting of migratory game birds and insectivorous birds. But even then, we still needed something. So in 1916, there was a treaty between the United States and Great Britain on behalf of Canada. And that gives us our hunting season for game birds. But it was this treaty that formed the basis of the very important act I'm talking about today. And that's the Migratory Treaty Act of 1918. But then this act is the definition of take. It's unlawful to hunt, take, capture, kill, not only adult birds, but also their young, their eggs, part of their nests, their feathers. There's over a thousand different species protected under the MBTA. We also have four different conventions incorporated into this act over time, which includes the opening of bird sanctuaries and monitoring bird populations. It's very important to consider the fact the MBTA, when it was first written, it's actually a strict liability statute. Within the MBTA, we have a misdemeanor uh, violation up to $15,000 for the illegal take of a bird. In 1986, this was amended to include felonies of selling birds or their feathers or their eggs. It could be $2,000. Now, we know about this definition of a, a deliberate take, the intentional killing of a bird which was the point of the MBTA when it was first founded in 1918 to stop the activities of hunters and poachers. 
But in the 1970s, we have the advent of the environmental movement, and we see how industry has affected birds as well. So we have incidental take, the accidental killing of, t accidental killing of these birds. It may not be your mens rea, but the actions you're performing is contributing to the death of bird populations. We see this in industry. We have protections against it in the ESA. So the courts have decided it also applies to the MBTA definition of take. Now I decided to investigate five different forms of take in my paper. We have bird strikes, communication towers, oil spills, seabird bycatch, and wind turbines. Now with bird strikes, that's the collision between an animal and a man-made vehicle. The first recorded bird strike is in 1905 with Orville Wright. So the creator of the airplane created the first bird strike in our history. But between 1990 and 2017, there was almost 2,000 wildlife strikes with civil aircraft alone. Not including military aircraft or commercial aircraft, just civil aircraft. And the largest number of strikes happened during the migratory period. It also happens at lower altitudes. 92% of bird strikes happen below 35,000 feet, mostly between takeoff and landing of airplanes. As you can see, with the species of birds who are most affected, these are the ones who fly at lower altitudes, your gulls, your waterfowl, your raptors. There are over 500 different species of birds involved in these strikes, and 90% of them are protected under the MBTA. With communication towers, you see them at airports directing pilots, but also you have your cell phone towers, emergency broadcasting, paging, messaging, things we take for granted. We see these tall towers along our highways. There are over 160,000 communication towers in the United States. But they're responsible for up to 7 million deaths of birds annually. The reason why is that birds are attracted to the light of these towers. They circle them constantly, not knowing where to land, until they die of exhaustion or starvation or they collide with these towers that cause attraction to light. The deadliest sites are in the southeast and the midwest because they have the highest concentration of towers, also the tallest towers in our country. Moving from the aviation to the maritime, we have seabird bycatch and fisheries. Now, bycatch is the accidental entanglement or hooking through fishing gear. With seabirds, there's over 150 of them protected by the MBTA. And seabirds are attracted to fishing vessels. You see this in pictures all the time with seagulls flying behind a fishing vessel looking for bait or offal or things that are thrown off the boat. However, when they come down, sweep down to the boat to try and catch that fish, sometimes they get hooked. There are three different types of fishing activity or technologies that fishermen use. Law lying, gill net, and trawling. All three of them are responsible for the accidental death of birds. For long line, which is a line of hooks behind a fishing vessel, there's over 320,000 seabirds caught annually by these vessels. They're dragged into the water and drowned. In gillnet, they become entangled. A minimum of 40,000 deaths annually from gillnet entanglement. Now with trawling, there's not so much entanglement, but with collision. So it's really hard to find statistics, but scientists know that this is also a cause of incidental take in birds. But a big player, especially where I'm from, is oil spills. We all hear about oil spills in the news. We all know what happens in our gulf, in our rivers, in our lakes. But two of the biggest culprits in our recent history are Exxon Valdez and Deepwater Horizon. The export Exxon Valdez oil spill released 11 million gallons of crude oil into Prince William Sound in Alaska. Records show that there were 30,000 dead birds found in this spill, but the actual estimate was close to 250,000 birds. In Exxon v. Baker, there was an agreement to pay a $150 million fine, which was reduced down to 25, but there was also additional 100 million in criminal restitution. This was because of the MBTA and the amount of birds who were affected by this oil spill. From 1989 on, this was thought to be the worst oil spill in U.S. history. We all know now that it isn't. The worst one is Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. 
In 2010, the Deepwater Horizon rig exploded and spewed over 130 million gallons of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico. I have more of a connection with this oil spill than some people because of where I live in southeast Louisiana. When it happened, I could sit in my room and the inside of my nose burned. The widespread effects that happened in not only with the Gulf of Mexico, also in our wetlands, and the cleanup efforts afterwards led to the death of almost over one million birds. Now, in ex United States versus BP, there was a $4 billion criminal plea agreement, and part of that was because of MBTA violation. For each bird, that's a $15,000 fine. In settlement, that was a $1 million fine in fees for the MBTA violation. When you read papers about oil spills, people involved in the industry always say there are two different acts that are the banes of our existence. One is Open 90, the other is the MBTA. Now, wind turbines are a bit more controversial because clean energy is such an important part of our recent understanding of energy. We should push more, more clean energy efforts. On land, there are over 50,000 land-based wind turbines producing 8% of the world's of our nation's energy. However, wind turbines are not as great for our birds. There's estimated 140,000 to 328,000 birds killed annually with collision with wind turbines. And this is worse at night when they cannot see the wind turbines turning. But it's not just land-based turbines we have an issue with. There's a growing industry in off on offshore wind, -based or wind farms. At the time I wrote this paper, there were 12 active leases, West Coast, East Coast, Hawaii, Great Lakes. If birds collide with, with offshore wind turbines, we cannot collect their numbers because they're washed away by wave action. But we do know that this activity does occur. So looking at it in summary, if you looked at the numbers I just told you today, upwards of nine million birds are killed annually in industry. And that's just from these five different types of takes alone. Now, the circuits, we have a difference in how they interpret the word take. In the second and 10th circuit, they do recognize incidental take or accidental take is violating the MBTA. We saw this first in a second secret case of F FMC Corp, in which when they washed pesticides into a wastewater retention pond without realizing they were doing so, the pesticides killed the birds who were residing on that pond. To them, it's that we did not intentionally kill these birds. There was no deliberate take. You may not have pulled the trigger, but you're actually to contribute to the death of these birds. So yes, you are responsible. And when Apollo Andrews came up in the 10th Circuit, this was also the view that they took. It became a proximate cause analysis. But the 8th and 9th Circuit had a completely different view. Only direct and intentional takings from the plain meaning of the statute count. We saw this both in Seattle too, and in Newton City Wildlife. But the effects of both these views came to a head in the Fifth Circuit where I'm from, the United States versus Sitco. The district court actually saw the activities of Sitco as incidental take and to, in fact, find them as such. But upon appeal three years later, they switched the definition to, into, to direct take. The only deliberate action to kill a bird counts. And in fact, that is the definition we have now. Almost 100 years after the beginning of the MBTA, we now come to the definition that only deliberate take counts for violations. If you do not, inten if you do not intentionally need to kill a bird, you won't be it's, that's the only violation you have. So all those industrial players, that 9 million deaths a year, no longer has violations against them. If another oil spill happens in the Gulf of Mexico and kills a million birds, they won't be penalized for it. And in fact, in April 2018, Fish and Wildlife Service says the prohibitions only count when there's a purpose to lack to deliberately take the life of a bird or its eggs or its nest. Now, there were a few complaints from different organizations about this new interpretation. This was, these were all in the Southern District of New York. However, as of July 31st, 2019, They've been consolidated into one complaint. But in fact, this definition is arbitrary and capricious. It is unlawful, and it should reinstate that previous standard. As of the time I checked this morning, this is still an open complaint in court. 
and hopefully it will continue to be so. But this shows us that we need some future federal framework to tell us exactly what the definition of take is. At the state level, each state has different laws. It's impossible now to figure out what the take, definition of take is at each state, as it was back in Missouri versus Holland. That's because birds are transboundary. You can't have a different law in a different state about the definition of take for these birds, because that would be confliction amongst the states. We need something on a federal basis. From here, we know there's two different avenues we can take, one being with the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court. It is their job to interpret statutes. An MBTA case moving up to the Supreme Court can finally tell us the definition of take. But as of our knowledge, there has been no case in front of, the, uh, in front of SCOTUS about the MBTA definition of take as a legal question. So the other avenue we can take is Congress. They're the ones who create the acts. They're a legislator. They can amend the act to include something they'll take like they do with the ESA and make it more equivalent. Or they can tell us we're not gonna change it because they've had decades to do so if they were going to. But from our standpoint, when this act was created in 1918, the people who created this act could not have imagined the advancements we've had technology the way we see them now. Moving to the sky to the stars, the way we know now, was works of science fiction back when this was created. Birds have been important for thousands of years. They spread seeds, they help us grow plants. We can hear their songs outside. It's just the difference now is that we can see the much more far-reaching impacts of our actions. And for all of us here, we have chosen to have the privilege to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And it's our job to protect them the way they were supposed to be protected since 1918. Now, our current administration has clipped the wings and grounded this very important act. And it's my hope this narrow scope they now have will broaden and to see it fly again. Thank you. Thank you everyone for having me here today to ALDS and CALS. It's a real honor to be invited here to speak. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my paper, which was called A Taxonomy of Class Actions for Animals, or put another way, how to be Aaron Brockovich for the animals. So there's a lot to cover. So I'm quickly going to note that my presentation is going to be divided into three parts. In part one, I'm going to tell you why I chose to focus my research on class actions and why I think they're a really powerful tool for the animal law movement. In part two, I'm going to talk about the types of class actions involving animals that have been filed in the United States. And in part three, I'm going to talk about some of the problems that animal class actions have faced and suggest some solutions for overcoming them. So part one, why focus on class actions? So um, as was mentioned in my introduction, I worked in Australia as a class actions lawyer for about five years before coming to Portland to study my Masters of Animal Law at Lewis and Clark. So given my background, I was really interested to explore how class actions could be used for the benefit of animals rather than just for the benefit of humans. Um, I'm going to get into the rules governing what a class action is in a little bit, but in case anyone here is unfamiliar, a class action is a procedural mechanism which allows a large number of individual claims to be aggregated and run as a single proceeding. A class action is usually commenced by a single plaintiff on behalf of a class of similarly affected individuals, such as a group of people who bought the same defective consumer product or were injured by the same natural disaster or bought shares in the same unscrupulous company. So the great thing about class actions is it allows you to run one case on behalf of a large group of victims at once, rather than having to run hundreds or even thousands of individual claims. And because when you aggregate a large number of class sorry, a large number of claims, they tend to be worth a lot of money, then they also tend to attract a lot of media attention. So they're a really powerful way of holding governments and corporations to account and causing them to change their behaviour. It's therefore no surprise that class actions have been strategically utilised by almost every social justice movement in the US, from civil rights to women's rights to environmental justice. So we've seen class actions filed in respect of school segregation, toxic torts, climate change, sex discrimination, as well as the harms caused by the tobacco industry, Agent Orange, the BP oil spill, defective med medical devices, data privacy breaches, and the list goes on. These days, there's rarely a major corporate wrong that is not accompanied by a class action. 
So why not for animals as well? After all, harm to animals is currently occurring on such a massive scale, particularly when it comes to farmed animals. It makes sense to think about mass legal action and what we can do in the most effective and efficient way to alleviate the suffering of the largest number of animals at once. So when I started this research, what I was really hoping to find was evidence of class actions being filed directly in the US on behalf of animals. So on, for example, you can imagine a really powerful class action being filed on behalf of all pigs kept at a certain CAFO who were being mistreated, on behalf of all hens kept in a battery hen facility that was breaching the law, or on behalf of an endangered species that existence was being threatened by human actions. Unfortunately, when I started to look into it, I quickly found that that wasn't really happening, at least not yet. Uh, to date, there haven't been any class actions that I'm aware of that have been filed on behalf of an animal plaintiff on behalf of a class of similarly affected animals. And while that's disappointing, it's not hard to figure out why. As will be discussed throughout this conference extensively, animals are legal property and not legal persons. And so because they're legal property, they cannot hold legal rights, not even the most basic rights, like the right to life or the right to sue but rather are the subject of other people's legal rights. And that makes it very difficult to file any litigation on behalf of animals, including class actions. People have tried, of course. We have the Non-Human Rights Project who are looking to file habeas cases on behalf of certain animals, as well as some other notable examples. But these cases have really struggled to get past the issue of standing, um, which I won't go into today because it's a huge topic and I'm sure will be covered elsewhere. But in short, it's very difficult to meet the standing requirement that an animal or a group of animals has suffered an injury in fact that's a violation of a legally protected interest when the law doesn't recognise that animals have legal interests at all. So I wasn't able to find class actions being filed on behalf of animals directly. But what I did find was a really interesting range of class actions have been filed not by animals, but for animals. So I'm talking about instances where lawyers have cleverly used human plaintiffs to file class actions which on paper are about harm that's been done to humans, but at their heart are really about harm that's been done to animals. So that's what my paper ended up being about, a taxonomy of the different types of animal-related class actions that have been filed in the US and what lessons we can learn from them. So the first category of cases I found is involving companion animals. So that's where uh, plaintiffs are the human owners of animals that have been injured or harmed in some way. And in these cases, standing is fairly straightforward because the harm to these animals is treated as harm to property. The second category of cases I found was involving non-companion animals. So that's where the animals in question are not owned by the human plaintiffs, where the plaintiffs or their lawyers really have been able to frame a class action that implicates both human and animal interest. So I'll start by talking about the non-companion animal cases because they're perhaps the more creative types of class actions we've seen. So the first area I found non-companion animal related class actions is the relation to animal testing. The most notable example of this occurred in 2012 when three class actions were commenced against cosmetics companies Mary Kay, Estee Lauder and Avon for fraudulently representing that they did not test their products on animals when in fact all three companies were still testing products on animals in China. The class actions were ultimately discontinued by the plaintiffs. However, the cases are worth noting because of a really interesting interlocutory judgment where the court observed that, quote, consumers have grown more aware of the social, environmental, and political impact of their purchasing decisions. It should not be unexpected then that when companies make misrepresentations about their company-wide operations, they face potential liability in court to consumers who relied on those representations in purchasing their products. So this is a really useful acknowledgement from the court that consumers do care about the ethical claims that companies make and highlights that these kinds of representations could be fertile ground for more class actions in the future. The second category of cases I came across was humane food claims. So quite a number of class actions have been filed in respect of misrepresentations made by the agricultural industry in the advertising and labelling of food products, particularly in respect to chickens and eggs. The issue arises because terms such as cage-free and free-range are not defined by law, and therefore consumers, who are often willing to pay a premium for products that represent higher animal welfare, are forced to rely on questionable industry certification standards that often do not match public expectations about animal welfare. And so this mismatch of public expectations and industry practices, combined with a large number of consumers purchasing eggs and chicken products, makes this area a prime target for class actions, most of which have been successfully resolved through settlement. Uh, for example, the processed egg producers antitrust litigation was a putative class action that was settled for $80 million after a group of egg producers was found to have conspired to increase egg prices. 
One of the most frustrating aspects of this case was that the conspiracy was conducted under the auspices of an animal welfare program that was supposedly aimed at improving cage prices, cage sizes for hens, but in truth was actually designed to control the supply of eggs and drive up prices. Both the Humane Society and ALDF have also filed putative class actions against major poultry companies such as Purdue Farms and Petaluma Egg Farms for falsely representing that their products were not humanely raised and free range when they were not. Uh, both these class actions also set it on favourable terms. And then most recently, in March 2019, Peter filed a putative class action against Nelly's Free Range Eggs, which alleges that the company made false and misleading representations through the labelling and packaging of their eggs, which showed hens roaming freely outside when in fact they were being held in sheds with 20,000 hens per shed. Um, so I understand this class action is still ongoing at the moment. And so the last category of non-companion animal class actions I found was in respect to animals in entertainment. So animals held in captivity for the entertainment of humans, such as zoos, aquariums, and circuses. Um, for example, the Peter Foundation commenced a putative class action on behalf of individuals who purchased tickets to the Seoul Circus. Peter was representing individuals who all purchased tickets in reliance on the company's seemingly robust animal rights policy, which was published on its website. However, the reality was that the welfare of circus animals was not very good, and the circus, the circus vendors had actually been found to violate the Animal Welfare Act on 17 separate occasions. And these proceedings ended up settling on confidence confidential terms in 2017. Uh, finally, a variety of consumer class actions were also commenced against SeaWorld in the wake of the 2013 documentary Blackfish, which exposed the cruel conditions in which orcas are held in SeaWorld marine parks. These class actions are seeking injunctions and damages on behalf of ticket purchasers who felt they'd been misled by SeaWorld's previous statements regarding its humane treatment of orcas. And last I checked, this class action was still ongoing. So. Um, so, uh, you'll notice I've mentioned a few times that these class actions settled prior to certification, so I sh should explain what that means. Basically, while anyone can purport to file a class action, it only formally becomes one in the eyes of the law once it has, once a court certifies that it meets all the requirements of a class action, which at the federal level are set out in Rule 23 of the Rules of Civil Procedure. So the decision as to whether a class action should be certified will generally be determined after an interlocutory hearing, although the timing of this hearing can vary. Sometimes it happens right at the beginning of a class action, sometimes it can be years into the class action until this hearing occurs. But the crux of it is that until an order certifying the class is made, the litigation is only a putative class action or a purported class action. Uh, so we should look briefly at these requirements for certification because they're really important. I've listed them on the slide up here, but the one I want to focus on is the third and final requirement, which is, comes under Rule 23B3 of the Rules of Civil Procedure, and it provides that a class action may only be maintained if, quote, the court finds that the questions of law or fact common to class members predominate over any questions affecting only individual members, and that a class is superior to other available methods for fairly and efficiently adjudicating the controversy. So these requirements are known in shorthand as the predominance and superiority requirements, and they're really critically important. Uh, particularly, the requirement that common issues predominate over individual issues in the class action is a real challenge for a lot of litigation, and it's where a lot of class actions get tripped up. Um, so if we go back to the slide before, what I was finding in my research was in the non-companion animal cases I was talking about against zoos and circuses, they were um, not actually reaching the stage where they had a class certification hearing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of these class actions actually settled either confidentially on a really favorable terms and attracted a lot of media attention about the animal treatment issues they were raising, which is a great thing. Um, but in terms of me doing my research, what it meant was there weren't a lot of reported class certification decisions in this area, um, which meant there wasn't a lot for me to analyze in terms of how these requirements might be applied to animal law class actions. On the other hand, the companion animal class actions listed up there were much more likely to reach the class certification stage. But unfortunately, when they reached a class certification hearing, they generally were denied certification because they couldn't establish predominance. So they couldn't establish that common issues in their case would predominate over individual issues. And what I really found was that because animals are simultaneously property and living beings, they run into a really unique combination of certification problems that really go to the heart of the way that the law treats animals. So what you'll see when I go through some of these companion animal cases in a moment is that they struggle with problems commonly associated with defective product claims because under the law, 
the anim animals are treated like any other consumer products like a defective dishwasher or a broken table. But at the same time, these cases also struggle with problems associated with mass tort claims involving humans. And that's because at the end of the day, animals are nothing like a defective dishwasher. They're living creatures with a complex biology, individualized medical histories, and variable lifestyle factors that all raise individual questions about how their body's gonna to react to a product or something that's, that's been applied to them and caused them harm. So animal class actions are really being hit with this double whammy of problems that other class actions don't face. And this is really problematic because once class certification is denied, the putative class action goes back to being an individual action on behalf of a single plaintiff. If the hundreds or thousands of former class members wish to pursue their claims, they, now, they must now individually engage their own lawyers to file their own separate claim. This disaggregation of claim means that the class action basically goes away, there's way less pressure on the defendant to settle, and anecdotally, most cases just end up being discontinued if they're denied certification. So this is a real big problem. If we want class actions for animals to be impactful and part of creating meaningful change for animals, then we need to be able to overcome these hurdles and get class certification. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna be talking specifically about companion animal class actions, the problems they've faced, and how we can try to overcome them. So the one, one of the big categories I found of class action being filed in respect to companion animals is in respect to puppy mills. So that's intensive commercial breeding operations where animals often grow up in cramped, unsanitary conditions with inadequate vet care, and they often have health and behavioral problems later in life. It's sadly estimated that at least 90% of puppies sold in pet stores were actually raised in a puppy mill, which is something that a lot of consumers don't know and therefore makes it fertile ground for consumer class actions. For example, in 2007, the Humane Society filed a class action against notorious Florida puppy dealer, Wizard of Claws, alleging the company had defrauded consumers by misrepresenting the origins of its puppies and selling dogs from puppy farms who suffer severe health problems and genetic defects. It was reportedly the first class action filed by the Humane Society and the first class action against any puppy mill in the United States. Subsequent class actions have used similar strategies to target pet stores, allegedly selling dogs from puppy mills, such as the class action by the ALDF against Barkworks and by the Humane Society against Petland. However, both cases were denied class certification. In the case against Petland, the problem was in relation to the issue of reliance. So this is another common problem that consumer product class actions faced, where class members claim they've suffered financial loss or harm by virtue of relying on false or misleading representations made by the defendant in respect of their products. Because the circumstances of each person's reliance might be different, for example, people might have read different things from the pet store's website, or been told certain things about the dog's origin from staff in store, or not read anything at all before purchasing a dog, it really requires an individualized assessment to determine whether the person actually relied on those representations. And therefore, courts have commonly found that where reliance must be established, it will likely not be suitable for a class action because it wouldn't meet that predominance requirement. So moving on, the largest category of animal class actions I found was in relation to defective products that have caused harm to companion animals. That's particularly in respect of flea and tick treatments and in respect of pet food. One of the earliest animal-related class actions filed was a Conan and Hart's Mountain Group, where the plaintiffs commenced a putative class action in respect of an aerosol flea and tick spray called Blockade. The product contained no instructions on dosage or how the product should be applied, and the manufacturer, Hearts, quickly received over 3,000 complaints of animals experiencing side effects, including seizures, vomiting, and death, probably due to over-application of the product. Despite the serious harm this product caused to animals, class certification was denied again because the court was concerned individual issues would predominate over common issues. While the court accepted there would be some common issues, such as whether blockade product was defective or whether hearts gave adequate warnings about the dangers of the property, the court ultimately reached the view, following the leading case on mass torts committed against humans, that individual issues were likely to overwhelm any common issues, particularly given, quote, the physiological differences among the pets of class members such as species, weight, size, age, and health. So this was a disappointing outcome for a product that seemingly harmed such a large group of animals. A second wave of flea and tick treatment cases were filed in 2009-2010 after the EPA reported a sharp increase in the number of incidents being reported from the use of spot-on flea and tick treatments. And seven related putative class actions ended up being filed against the manufacturers of these products. In one of these actions, Martani and Wyeth, uh, proceedings were commenced on behalf of all individuals who purchased the defendant's spot-on 
treatment called Promeris, where they asserted had failed to eradicate their dogs, fleas and ticks and caused them to suffer lethargy, vomiting and diarrhoea. However, the problem was that the evidence showed only 0.14% of 2.2 million doses of Promeris had reported any adverse reaction in dogs. This is still a large number of animals affected, of course, but a small number overall. And at the certification hearing, the court expressed concerns that given this low injury rate amongst the class, the only way to determine whether Promeris was defective in the sense that it caused harm would be to conduct an intensive inquiry into whether each class member's dog suffered harm and what proximately caused the harm. The result being that these individual inquiries would predominate over common issues and therefore class certification was denied. Um, there's been some better success in terms of pet food class actions. In 2010, in re Pet Foods product liability litigation settled for $24 million after over 100 class actions were commenced on behalf of consumers who purchased contaminated pet food that was ultimately recalled. On the other hand, other cases involving uh, dog pet treats that caused digestion issues in dogs were not as successful and ultimately were denied class certification for some of the reasons I've discussed. Um, so overall, what I was seeing is while there was a lot of great class actions being filed, um, we weren't getting a lot of success. So in my paper, I suggest a range of solutions for overcoming these problems. Um, I don't have time to go into all of them today, so I'm just going to focus on one of them, which is how to deal with the situation where harm to animals only manifests itself in a part of the class and not the whole class of animals. Um, so going back to the case I discussed earlier about the about the pet food and the dog treats. Um, the court denied certification because, among other reasons, the treats were found to only cause digestion issues in some, but not all of the dogs. Same with the spot-on flea treatments. Because they only caused a reaction in a small percentage of animals, the court said it required an individualized assessment of harm that would defeat the predominance requirement. And the same issue, issue arose in the pet shop or puppy mill cases. Certification was denied because not every dog purchased ended up being sick as a result of their treatment in the puppy farm and so therefore it required an individualised medical assessment of which dogs were actually harmed. So one way that I think that advocates might be able to get around this is what I've described as the mouldy washing machine approach. I think I wrote dishwasher on the slide, so you'll have to blame jet lag for that one. Um, but what I'm referring to is a recent series of cases called the INRI Whirlpool Corp front-loading washer products liability litigation. And this was a class action commenced on behalf of consumers who purchased washing machines that had a high propensity to develop mould. However, not all washing machines had developed this problem yet, and there was a chance that some of them would not develop it at all. It just had a higher propensity to develop such a problem. And so despite this, the court was still willing to certify the class. The court concluded that, quote, if defective design is ultimately proved, all class members have experienced injury as a result of the decreased value of the product purchased. So in other words, even if their washing machine had not developed a mold problem, they had still suffered a legally cognizable harm because they'd overpaid for a product with this potential defect. And I think this is a really compelling argument that can be applied to animal-related class actions as well. If you purchased a cat food or a flea or tick treatment and then later found out that the food or treatment had a tendency to make your animal sick and this was not disclosed to you before you bought the product, then there's a fair argument to say that you've suffered harm even if your animal hasn't actually been directly affected and that's because you wouldn't have bought the product or paid as much for the product if you'd known this defect existed. The argument is perhaps even stronger in respect of dogs purchased from a pet store which turn out to actually have come from a puppy mill. You might have a perfectly healthy, happy dog at home, but the fact remains that you paid a premium for a dog that came from a seemingly reputable pet store and instead actually came from a poorly run mass breeding operation that caused many other dogs to get sick. So even if your dog didn't actually get sick, you still suffered a harm in terms of overpaying for a dog. So this is an argument I haven't seen used yet in any animal related class actions, but now that this precedent's been set, I think it has a really great potential to overcome some of the certification problems that I've discussed today. Um, so to conclude, I just want to emphasise that although we've seen a lot of struggles for class actions for animals, I really think that there's still a really viable, important area that can be used to help animals. Um, and I really hope that my paper and my presentation today encourages everyone to at least consider them as one strategy in our toolbox to try and help animals. Um, given the mass sufferings going on, I really think we need to keep looking to mass solutions. Thanks. Hi. 
I'm Mary Walsh. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a third year in the part-time evening program at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. And during the day, I work in, well, I help manage the phase one clinical trials program of a cancer center in Cleveland. Um, please don't tell my employer, but I'm actually in law school to go into animal law, not healthcare law. Don't let them know. I'd like to speak with you today about a paper that I wrote um, that I entitled Feeding Fido, the Case for Restitution in Ohio Animal Cruelty Convictions, and a little bit of background before we get started. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Ohio, specifically Cleveland, well, we have a couple things to be proud of. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of this guy, but uh, LeBron James used to be a Cleveland Cavalier, won the championship for us. We're still very proud of our local hometown hero. I'm particularly proud of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland because they just announced that Dave Matthews Band has been nominated for next year's induction. Um, but outside of Cleveland, living in Ohio is difficult for those of us who are concerned with animal cruelty laws. We are ranked by the Animal Legal Defense Fund as 29th in the country. So that's about middle of middle tier. Um, we're not as bad as Kentucky, no offense to anyone from Kentucky, but we obviously have room to improve our laws. And so the question is, how do we strengthen those laws? Well, uh, the obvious answer is to enact new legislation, amend existing legislation, but everyone in this room is aware that that's a very slow process. And I also was not allowed to try that in the course for which I wrote this note. So instead, my question was, can I research existing Ohio case law to better interpret the statutes that we have on the books? Maybe case law in different fields could help us interpret our statutes so that um, either the anti-cruelty statutes or other statutes could be reread or used in a way to increase the depth of the cruelty laws that we currently have. And that's how I came up with this topic. Um, as I was researching the animal cruelty convictions in Ohio, I discovered that the trial courts were routinely assessing restitution upon conviction of animal cruelty to be paid to the humane societies that were caring for the seized or the forfeited animals. But then the appellate courts were overturning those restitution orders on appeal. And it turns out that they were overturning the orders for a variety of reasons that in my opinion were misinterpretations of Ohio law. The most interesting aspect of the appellate court's reversals is how the, the shift in their rationale for overturning restitution actually tracks with a shift in the way society views animals and especially companion animals. So in the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, the first and the sixth districts overturned restitution awarded to humane societies because they held that under Ohio law, restitution can only be ordered when there's property damage. And in these cases of ant uh, animal cruelty, the property, an the animals, were damaged or abused before they were forfeited to the humane societies. So they weren't owned by the humane societies when they were abused, and therefore the humane societies did not have property damage, and so they couldn't um, collect the restitution. In the mid-2000s, the third and the 10th districts, which are highlighted here in a different color for a specific reason, um, they shifted away from this argument of property damage and instead held that under Ohio law, restitution can only be paid to victims or survivors of the victims for economic loss. And so the humane societies, since they weren't the victims of the animal abuse, they weren't allowed to receive restitution. Um, in 2018 and 2019, the most recent cases came from the second and the 12th districts, and they essentially upheld the restitution only because the appellant either didn't appeal the order or didn't object to the order at the trial court level. And these cases are, they're worth mentioning not because they upheld restitution, but because it shows that the trial courts are still ordering restitution even though the appellate courts have this practice of overturning the orders. Those are the animal cruelty convictions on appeal. If we turn to the non-animal cruelty convictions on appeal, on this slide, um, we find that the same appellate courts 
that overturned restitution in animal cruelty convictions, arguing that it could only be paid to victims, actually upheld restitution to non-victims in non-cruelty cases. Uh, in 20, sorry, 2004, the third district case involved insurance fraud, and the offender argued that his insurance company was not a victim of the arson that he was convicted of setting, and so they shouldn't be able to receive the restitution that was ordered of him. And this is pretty much the same argument that the third district said for humane societies. They weren't the victims of the crime. But here, the third district actually upheld the restitution and they said, no, in this case, third parties can be given restitution. It doesn't just have to go to victims because to hold otherwise would essentially reward the offender for his own felonious acts. The 10th district case involved a judge who was convicted of failing to file accurate campaign statements. And he was ordered to pay a couple hundred dollars in restitution to a local food bank, which had nothing to do with his crime at all. Um, and so the judge appealed his restitution order and he said, I didn't cause any property damage to this food bank. Why are they receiving restitution from me? In this case, the 10th district upheld the order and they said, okay, maybe awarding restitution to a non-victim is a deviation from a legal rule. It's also consistent with the overall sentencing purposes for, for misdemeanor, misdemeanor sentencing, which is to deter future criminal activity. And it's based on sound reasoning. And I completely agree with the appellate courts in the non-animal cruelty convictions. Restitution can be paid to non-victims, and um, I actually have the S Supreme Court of Ohio to back me up. Um, in Bartholomew, the defendant was convicted of raping a minor, and the trial court ordered him to pay restitution to a crime victims fund. Because he couldn't pay the minor directly, the money would go to a third party, and then the third party would pay for the victim's counseling costs. The defendant did not object to the restitution order at trial, but he did appeal it. And on appeal, the third district again held in this case that Ohio law does not authorize a trial court to order restitution to a third party. The state appealed and the Supreme Court of Ohio upheld the restitution order. They argued that Ohio law actually is written to allow restitution to be paid to an agency designated by the court or to a third party. And the rationale was if the General Assembly really didn't want restitution to be paid to anyone but a victim, they would have eliminated um, adult probation departments, clerks of courts, and other agencies as designated by the court as possible pay payees. So the argument then based on Bartholomew is that humane societies should be included in that other agencies designated as payees category. Um, because humane societies are actually, in Ohio and I'm assuming elsewhere, um, they're statutorily created to enforce cruelty laws for animals and for children. And the similarities between the way a crime victim fund works and a humane society operates strengthens the argument under Bartholomew. Crime victim funds are allowed to cover, under Ohio law, costs of medical care, rehabilitation, um, even attorney's fees. And in Ohio, the Humane Societies actually have to hire out private attorneys for misdemeanor prosecutions, and then they pay to rehabilitate the forfeited animals to them. In the ideal world, we could argue that um, the legal system should view the animals themselves as victims. And that would be nice. But even I can acknowledge that, you know, animals don't have checking accounts. At least my dog doesn't. And so how are the restitution funds going to be deposited if the, we give them to the animals? And so a third party acting as a guardian for the forfeited animals should receive the restitution. As the legal status of animals has changed, so too has the policy argument for enforcing stronger anti-cruelty laws. For centuries, animals were only thought of as man's property. In pre-colonial times, the biblical dominion doctrine governed how animals were to be treated, and basically man ruled over everything. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a statute was actually enacted, and it 
appears to be concerned with animal cruelty. It actually reads, no man shall exercise any tyranny or cruelty toward any brute creature. But if you read case law at the time, it turns out that the states were more concerned with preserving public morals and not actually protecting the animals. In the 19th century, um, the early half, animals were protected as property under malicious mischief and trespass statutes. So at common law, a dog or a horse was an inanimate piece of property just like a wagon was. And these statutes created a duty that said one person cannot damage another person's property. In order for animal cruelty to be criminalized under these statutes though, the offender had to manifest malice toward the owner when he was harming the animal. So if the offender harmed the animal without any hostility toward the owner, then the animal's harm did not constitute malicious mischief and there was no crime. So in other words, if the property damage did not personally harm the owner of the property, there was no cause of action for animal cruelty. The first anti-cruelty law was enacted in 1821, but it only protected cattle and horses from torture, and that was because these animals were commercially valuable. So the laws were really only concerned with the treatment of animals in so much as their harm would decrease their value to the owners. It wasn't until 1867 in New York that legislation was enacted that was explicitly concerned with the animals themselves. This was the first anti-cruelty statute to apply to any living creature and not just those that were commercially valuable like horses and cattle, but it also increased the list of offenses. So it banned animal fighting, it imposed duties of care, and it granted immunity to anyone entering a private property to rescue an animal. States slowly followed New York's lead and they enacted anti-cruelty statutes to represent a shift from pure property protection to a concern for the animal's welfare whether or not they were owned. So today, a stray unowned dog is protected under the same anti-cruelty laws in the same manner that a dog who is owned by an owner is. And in fact, um, so ownership is no longer a requirement to hold someone criminally liable for harming an animal. Owners themselves can be prosecuted if they hurt their pets. As anti-cruelty statutes have developed and expanded protection for animals, the common law has also incrementally shifted away from regarding domestic animals as only property. Back in the 1970s, New York again was ahead of the curve when a case stated that to say a dog is a piece of personal property and no more is a repudiation of our humanness. While courts may not be ready to extend recovery to say emotional distress for the loss of a pet, owners have been awarded costs in excess of an animal's value representing pecuniary losses, and damages have been based on the intrinsic value of pets because, as this court cited, pets have value in excess, in excess of that which would ordinarily attach to property. This recognition that animals are more than just property and that their welfare is valued in our society has driven each state to enact felony provisions in their anti-cruelty statutes and just two days ago, the US House of Representatives unanimously passed the Federal PACT Act, creating federal anti-cruelty statute. And hopefully we'll learn more about that tonight. Um, some states have taken their anti-cruelty statutes further. They mandate forfeiture upon conviction. Some have created pet courts. And these are all ways in which the law can work within our current legal system of property to expand the rights of animals. In forfeiture of animals and anti-cruelty prosecutions, the law distinguishes animals from other property forfeitures. So while real property lacks an ability to suffer, forfeiture is mandated in cruelty investigations or upon conviction, depending on the jurisdiction, because removing the animal is in the best interest of the animal, not because it's a piece of property that needs to be preserved as evidence for a prosecution. Some states, um, like Rhode Island, and advocacy groups prefer to use the term guardian rather than owner to reflect the legal obligations that humans have to animals within the legal system of property. Guardians have enforceable rights and obligations and they're arguably more accountable to the public than an owner is. 
And so by using this term, states can work within the legal framework to promote a personal responsibility in the person who holds the title without explicitly bestowing rights upon the animals. However, some advocates actually contend that anti-cruelty laws grant animals rights because they define substantive guarantees like food and shelter and water, and they impose a duty on humans to provide those necessities. And then the laws also provide a mechanism to enforce those duties through seizure of the animals. This actually further supports describing um, title holders as guardians instead, because under traditional guardianships, the law will intervene to remove a child or a ward from a guardian's care if the guardian doesn't fulfill his or her mandatory obligations. In my opinion, one of the more interesting developments in animal law involves states and jurisdictions that have created pet courts. And these are specialized dockets that generally only review misdemeanor violations of animal laws. They can enforce the animal laws and educate the public on the proper treatment of animals. And this helps to ensure that animal cruelty is taken seriously and that offenders are adequately deterred from committing future crimes. One of the most compelling arguments for taking anti-cruelty statutes seriously and for adequately deterring offenders is because of the evidence that cruelty to animals is a predictor of cruelty to humans. Animal cruelty is inextricably linked to domestic violence. 85% of domestic violence victims report that their pets were also abused. And this is a reason why most victims won't leave the households that they're in. One study found that 96% of juvenile sex offenders also sexually assaulted animals. There's also a predictive link between the deliberate and violent killing of companion animals to those who serial, serially kill humans. Because of this link between human and animal harm, some states with some of the best anti-cruelty statutes mandate cross-reporting between humane societies and children's and family services because animal cruelty and child abuse often coincide in the same households. So because animals are viewed as more than just property, and because animal cruelty needs to be seriously addressed to deter future harm toward humans, anti-cruelty statutes should be a lot tougher than the ones that we have in Ohio. We have two statutes on the books. Our original one is from the 1970s, and it still protects non-companion animals, so um, bears and horses, both of which have been seized in cruelty cases in Ohio. And then we also have Goddard's Law from the 2000s that protects only companion animals. And Goddard's Law is the law that includes felony provisions, but only fifth degree. As you can see, even the newer, stronger Goddard's Law caps the fines at $2,500. The national average is five to 10,000. And the only jurisdictions with fines lower than Ohio are interestingly Rhode Island and Guam. Um, Goddard's Law also restricts how the fines can be used. So while the money can go to humane societies in either statute, under Goddard's Law for companion animals, the fines can only be paid to hire or train new agents. And so none of the money can go toward actually caring for the animals that are seized. The appellate courts in Ohio don't seem to understand the nuances of the anti-cruelty statutes, which is compounded by their misinterpretation of restitution in these cases. Ohio, unfortunately, only permissively grants court's authority to order forfeiture upon conviction. They don't have to. But what's worse is that the current cruelty statutes limit the fines and they earmark their use after the animals are forfeited. A good example of this problem in Ohio um, can be seen in Anita Bybee's case. Um, she was convicted under Ohio's original anti-cruelty statute, so her fines could actually be paid to take care of her pets at the Humane Society. Um, the problem is that 188 dogs were seized from her property, and it cost the SPCA over $130,000 in care and rehabilitation costs. Her fines, because she pled to six counts only, totaled $4,500. Obviously, that wasn't enough to put a dent in the SPCA's costs, and so the, the trial court correctly, in my opinion, assessed $117,000 in restitution for the SPCA. And this was the balance remaining after the SPCA was able to adopt out some of those dogs. But then the first district unfortunately overturned the order. 
because our anti-cruelty statutes in Ohio limit and pigeonhole the fines that can be assessed, we can use Ohio's financial sanctions laws instead to help the humane societies with the costs incurred. In both a misdemeanor and felony sentencing in Ohio, the costs are permitted, sorry, the courts are permitted to assess restitution and they're advised to consider it in order to achieve the purposes of sentencing, which are to deter, deter future crime and punish the offender. Additionally, restitution amounts are discretionary. So while the amount that may be collected in fines is set by statute and it's determined based on the conviction, the amount ordered in restitution is up to the discretion of the court. And the Ohio trial courts have used this discretion to impose restitution on those convicted of animal cruelty, specifically to assist the humane societies caring for the abused animals. The Supreme Court of Ohio stated in Bartholomew that the purpose of financial sanctions is to require that the offender reimburse whatever entity paid the victim. If restitution is upheld to support non-victims and third parties in cases of insurance fraud or campaign violations or rape, then it should also be upheld to support third parties in animal cruelty cases. The Supreme Court of Ohio has paved the way to use restitution in anti-cruelty convictions so that we can strengthen the laws that we currently have in Ohio. Bartholomew states that the correct and consistent application of restitution under Ohio law is to allow restitution to be paid to agencies designated by the court, but the law doesn't specify what an agency is or when it's an appropriate designee. And so since humane societies are agencies that are statutorily created to take in abused animals, they should be an agency designated by the court to receive restitution. Since cruelty to animals is a predictor of crime against humans, we definitely want to deter that. But punishing those convicted of animal cruelty should also be taken seriously. The purposes of felony sentencing in Ohio are achieved in part when an offender has to make restitution to the victim of his crime or to the public. And the costs to the public that are incurred from damages caused by animal cruelty are significant. Humane societies should be able to depend on restitution when they investigate cases of animal abuse and rehabilitate seized animals. Humane societies would not incur thousands of dollars to rehabilitate dogs if people like Anita Bybee did not neglect 188 of them and force the law to intervene. Essentially, the person convicted of the crime should be the one responsible for the costs of rehabilitating their own animals. Thank you. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I learned a lot. Um, so before I open it up, um, I'm going to use my mic privilege to ask a couple questions of my own first. Um, so Tess, um, hearing you describe all the problems that can come with Rule 23 on the federal level, I was curious if you looked at uh, state level class actions or if that's even possible in this context or frankly at all. Um, is this on? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can get, sorry, me. Um, so I didn't look too much into state class actions. My focus was on the federal ones. But what I did find, which I talk about a bit in my paper, is that using state laws um, to run a class action, so using state consumer laws rather than federal consumer laws, can actually be quite a good way to run a class action because a lot of times state consumer laws don't, rely, don't require you to establish reliance, which was a big problem in a lot of the cases I looked at. So even if you run a federal class action, you can still bring claims under state laws, and I do explore a bit in my paper how state consumer actions might be a good way to go. Great. Um, and I'll just put in a plug for a former employer of mine, the Richmond Law Group. If anyone's interested, you might be familiar with them. They actually um, they were behind a lot of the recent uh, food-based and false claim actions. So uh, if anyone's interested in that, happy to, uh, to talk more about that. Um, I had a question also um, for, uh, for Mary. You, you, you talked about you know, how essentially the problem of animals being property, being things, not having bank accounts. I was curious if you looked into uh, this not so new, but still relatively new and in some ways evolving area of trusts for pets and animals. And if, if you see any, uh, if that's something you looked at and if you see that could kind of fill in that gap by essentially 
uh, just briefly, they're now, thanks to some of the folks in this very room, uh, over the last several decades, uh, I'm pretty sure every state in the U.S. has now passed uh, um, a change to their trust in a state code that allows for the creation of enforceable trusts for animals, whether they be pets or some states use just animals more generally. Uh, so have you looked at those at all? I haven't. Um, so full disclosure, when I wrote this note, I hadn't taken a states and trusts yet. And um, from what I learned about Ohio case law, that isn't an option. Mm. Um, but I'm sure... It, it, you know, it would be uh, any fund that we could get the restitution into would be helpful. So that's definitely uh, if anyone wants to write a follow up on this paper for their <laughs> law review note. <laughs> I would put in a plug for those because we've we've actually used them ourselves as an indication of, um, you know, the animal in the case actually has, well, a trust, but a property interest. So um, happy to talk more about that. And before I turn it over to uh, all of you. Um, I had a question, kind of observation question for spring. I, your talk reminded me and your paper reminded me of this story I heard earlier this year. Um, I forget the exact country, but in sub-Saharan Africa, um, vultures actually perform a very critical function, like a lot of, um, you know, carrion birds that they clean up, you know, corpses of other animals. And, and if they don't, and so the problem that they've faced is, um, vultures are diminishing in a lot of these places. And so they actually did an analysis and said that there's like a $6,000 value per vulture in terms of, so if you were trying to replace the function that they serve by getting rid of these corpses and cleaning them away and preventing the spread of disease that can happen, they had like a $6,000 value. And I, I was very interested to, to see that going back, you know, 100 years at this point, that there was a special... Um, designation for insect of insect vorious birds was that was that in recognition of the benefit that they provide and if you could speak a little bit more about um, if you know like if there's a number money value can attach to what birds do in terms of preventing controlling insects that is a very good question when we have the the Least Like Lean Migratory Bird Act, looking at federal action. We did know back in 1918 and back in 1909 when it was first reacted that birds have ecological services. For insect heavy as birds, it was more the fact that there were so many of them and that was primarily the type of birds that are being plucked to their feathers. Mm -hmm. So yes, they do help with the ecosystem that way, but looking at more the economic perspective. As far as trying to place a price on bird services, as far as helping spread seeds for farmers and vinters or helping to pollinate plants the same way bees do, it is difficult to place any price on an action of a bird or any species. Like one of the points of the ESA is that we can't place a price on an animal. So also placing a price on their services is quite difficult. Mm. I was interested to hear what you said about vultures because with a corpse, you have a concrete example of corpse removal mm -hmm. as opposed to services like decimating insect populations. I guess if you can look at how many insects are taken away in a certain farm and how birds do that, and looking at the cleanup costs versus pesticides, you do it that way as far as labor intensive activity. But putting the price on the birds themselves would be quite difficult. Mm. Well, I would think that might build some sympathy if, you know, they're controlling mosquitoes and stuff. We might gain From some Louisiana, more. Louisiana, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, we might gain some more allies that way. So, um, <laughs> I want to open it up now to any questions um, from all of you. I see one in the back. So I've got a question about, let's start with a So in your exploration, are the Ohio Valley courts distinguishing between restitution of the sort of vegetation and say cost of care? Did you catch that? Yeah. There was a question as to whether the appellate courts are treating, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, making a distinction between the cost of care and the restitution, like the actual payback for the crime and versus the care of the animal herself. So the restitution orders um, at the trial court level are they're set based on the costs that the humane societies incur. So it's not, 
it's not restitution as sort of a financial um, burden on the offender because of their crime. It's specific to the bill that the Humane Society gives to the prosecutor. That's a really good question. I actually don't remember off the top of my head um, what court that was in, but it's definitely true that there are, and look, being an Australian, I'm not a total expert on how all the circuits work, but I am aware that there are some circuits that have sort of more favourable um, decisions in terms of class certification and ones where it's a lot more difficult. So sometimes practitioners are strategic in the location where they actually are filing their class actions in the hope of getting a yeah, more favourable favorable decision. Yeah. So then we have the idea for environmental panels where it's all of the panels of I actually had Taylor in my mind this morning, especially considering the fact that it's been going on for a number of years and we're still trying to figure out the impacts of this, this slow leak that is expanding in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we do not have numbers yet of the kind of birds that have been affected by Taylor Energy and the fact that we have this new interpretation, I do not believe it's retroactive. So even if we do figure out there has been a million bird deaths since this 15 years since the leak has happened, there would be no action against the corporation Taylor for the deaths of the birds, unfortunately. However, if we do find out later on in the administration that we can change the definition again to include it, we might be able to bring cause then. Thank you for your question. I actually had one for Tess, if that's okay. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> you can't help it. I, uh, old habits die hard, I guess. Um, being from Australia and looking at our United States way of having class action suits and the way we treat animals. Have you noticed a big difference in the way that animals are viewed in Australia in the court system versus in the United States? And how would you describe that? Yeah, so unfortunately it's quite similar in Australia in the way we treat animals. Um, in, in a bad way, not in a good way, I guess. It's um, animals are treated as property in Australia. We have a very similar regime in terms of anti-cruelty statutes, which um, can be effective in uh, dealing with some cruelty to companion animals, but tend to exempt farm animals through codes of practice. So it's quite similar in the challenges that you're facing um, in the US. Um, in terms of class action specifically, I was really interested to come and do this research here because there aren't really that many that are going on in Australia in terms of animals. I think that's partly because um, we're just a much smaller country. I think there's been only 600 class actions filed in Australia ever, and here it's like, a million a year, literally. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on and, and that's why we're seeing a lot more here. So litigation for animals generally is a much smaller thing in Australia. Thank you. Thanks. I think I saw a hand, yeah. <laughs> so just to, uh, just so in case everyone hears that, um, it's a great question uh, whether, for Tess, whether she thinks that using consumer type laws um, to, to try to address problems uh, facing animals, if that somehow reinforces their property status. Yeah, I think that's a great question and one that I've thought about a lot, um, particularly when we're looking at like these um, puppy mill cases, you know, they're really being brought on behalf of people who've gone to a pet store and purchased an animal, which is already a problematic thing. I think everyone here knows that we should be adopting animals, not buying them from pet stores. So you're actually bringing cases on behalf of people who've sort of already done the wrong thing in some degree. And so you're, you're basically getting them compensation for that, that bad decision. And, and similarly with consumer cases, you are sort of reinforcing the status that animals are property in terms of what damage can be awarded. And they're, in some cases, you know, you have to think of them like property and reduce them down to property. I think that is problematic. At the same time, I think we're at the point in the movement where we need to be using all the tools that we can, and this is a really, in my mind, a really potentially effective tool for addressing suffering of a lot of animals. So I think that's sort of the trade-off that we need to use at the moment to actually achieve something for animals. Hi, back there. Hi, yeah, I have really first so let's say that Um, for like their time and navigation and obviously make sure 
A very good question. Thank you. Before this new interpretation of take, when we had to digital take, one of the things FWS said was that they would always message the corporation responsible for the take to see if there has any form of mitigation to not have that action happen in the future. And they would only bring the misdemeanor if the company does not mitigate. Now, one mitigation aspect we have with the Endangered Species Act is, in, is an digital take permit program where you talk about the number of, like, if you talk about the number of birds happening, living in an area and that we're having this logging activity, or we have the number of birds crossing this migratory trail that we can track because we monitor bird populations, that we may incidentally take these birds and have that permit for it, like we do with the ESA, and model it that way, that could be one way companies can go. Another one would be having those mitigation practices. For example, in Sitco, the reason why we had incidental death of birds is because they had birds in open well tanks in the Gulf of Mexico, and they were not covered by netting, and they refused to cover it with netting. They just left it open air. If they had done those mitigation effects and still the birds somehow got into the tanks, the fact that they had that mitigation would help them in that respect. Moving forward, if we can actually include incidental take into the MBTA, like we have with the ESA, like we have with the Bald Eagle Golden Eagle Act, it would be more standard inside our court system. And that way we can have a standard throughout different acts instead of having this one outlier with this one different rule. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. So um, I'm from, I'm one of the lucky ones from a law school that doesn't have animal law, so we need to talk later. Um, so I decided, I, I go to my law school because I have a day job. So the only law school that had a night program was Cleveland Marshall. And I love it, but I knew going into it there was no animal law, so, you know, we're fighting for it. But in the interim, I um, went out for law review because I knew that that was a way that I could write about whatever I wanted and I could take a course specific to that and get credit for it. So it was my way of kind of like making an animal law course for myself. I actually wanted to work more on a policy argument and then um, the professor that I signed up for for the course that went along with law review forced us to have a case-based um, paper which made me start from scratch and so I really, I, I probably am not the best researcher. I just started reading Ohio case law. And that's how I kind of stumbled upon this weird, the appellate courts were overturning restitution for different reasons and I didn't know why. So I looked into it more. It, it took a while. Um, I don't have any advice other than just read. Um, if you know that you're gonna try out for a journal and you have a summer before you start it, like maybe in your second or third year, um, read as much as you can about a topic that you're interested in, and you'll eventually find some sort of argument to make. Yeah, I think I totally agree. So this paper, even though I was doing my animal law LLM, I actually ended up writing this paper for a class actions class that I took. And so I think that's a, another key message is that animal law isn't really just one area of law. It touches so many areas of law from property to contract law to torts. It really covers anything. So I think even if you don't have an animal law class, there's often an angle you can use to write an animal law paper in a non-animal law class. Um, and it's often something that, you know, the professor might not have seen before. So it's probably interesting for them as well. So... <laughs> I would like to third that. <laughs> I also come from a school without an animal law course. We're working on it. <laughs> but um, I actually wrote mine as part of a writing seminar for a maritime journal class where I serve on the board this year. And for me, I wanted to show that there was an intersect between animal law and environmental law along with maritime and aviation, which is the reason why I chose my certain types of incidental take. Because we have these acts in animal law that impact so many different types and we see them as segmented and then we shouldn't. We should see the cohesiveness of our program. So I took this animal law idea and kind of shoehorned it into a maritime aviation prospect, which made mine a bit different according to my professor, but he agreed with the fact that it was something I should write about.
But one piece of advice I would give you is that when you choose your topic, make sure you love your topic. Make sure you're both able to live with that topic for months on end and you won't get burnt out by it. <laughs> because when you write, you write from yourself. And that if you don't like what you're writing, your reader will know. So make sure you're really passionate about what you're writing about. That's great advice. Any other uh, questions? I thought I saw another hand up. Yeah. <sighs> In the, the case referenced with the 188 dogs, she did make an argument on appeal that she couldn't afford it. And um, the, I know that the prosecutor in the case put together all of this information, um, was gonna put like a lien against her, and ultimately they didn't need to because the appellate court overturned it, but, but that is one of the arguments that's made. Um, and that's interesting too because a lot of the misdemeanor cases in Ohio are hoarding and the prosecutor hired out by the Humane Society, there's one guy who travels around the state of Ohio, everybody knows him, and he's like, I, most of, 99% of the cases that I see are these sweet little old ladies who get four dogs that I don't know how it turns into 188, but you know, they have good intentions and they just can't financially care for the dogs. So then the argument is, well, if they can't afford to care for the dogs, how are they gonna afford to pay restitution to the humane societies? And so there, there are, there would have to be civil judgments in that instance. But I haven't seen it specifically yet in the cases because they keep getting overturned. Can I ask another question? <laughs> Yeah, this is great, yeah. <laughs> I had one for Mary this time. Oh, I thought it was for me, but. <laughs> I have one for you too, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, sure, I'm here, okay. First, Mary. So, when you're looking at the link between domestic abuse and animal abuse, and how interconnected that is, and how different states are looking at restitution for that kind of connection, have you looked outside of Ohio at how other states treat that? And if so, what kind of model do you think Ohio should follow in the future to match the, some of the better ways that could be, that, that link, that kind of restitution could happen for animal abuse? So I, um, I did read a lot of case law from other states and the restitution didn't necessarily come up in, um, in conjunction with domestic violence, but I know that there is uh, for the, the link between domestic violence and animal cruelty, I know that some states are writing into their laws domestic violence provisions um, in regards to shelters allowing pets inside of them, and that's a, a big shift and one that um, I think needs to be addressed more, whether you put it in your anti-cruelty statute directly or in like a different part of the code that's probably something that needs to be addressed more so than restitution because of the domestic violence. Thank you, and hi, Kevin. Hello. <laughs> uh, for students like us who are trying to become published or writing these comments within our law schools, within our journals and topics like that, as somebody who has that perspective outside in the real world, what kind of benefits do you see being published in law school versus trying to get published outside of law school? Um, well, so I think one of the things that we, you know, not exactly everybody's reading law review articles, right? So it can be a, it can feel like sometimes you're talking to an almost empty room, but I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think that, you know, when you're doing law school scholarship, it's, it's kind of practice for your own work in a way. It's, that's, I think, kind of the most useful thing is that it's mostly for you versus when, not, in, not entirely, but versus publishing in the, quote, wider world, I think that's where you really, 
not to say that the law school stuff isn't vital, but if we're trying to really get this message out in a broader way, I think, you know, of course you have to. But I think that when we're trying to build, especially a novel legal argument, you know, judges can sometimes be, it's not gonna necessarily be a determining factor in a case, oh, I found this law review, but, you know, it can actually, it can make a difference. It shows that, again, there's this depth of, you're not the first person to think about it, or well, maybe you're citing your own paper, which, whatever, it's fine, but, um, it shows that there is, uh, you know, some level of depth that's been, that's been thought about. So I think that they're both very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. So bright. I'll try to uh, repeat. Yeah. <laughs> So um, the question is from a student in Arkansas who feels that um, she's asking for advice for how to, um, how to narrow your search for cases when you're looking for a topic to write about. If you're in a state like Arkansas that doesn't have a whole lot of positive uh, or you know, really prominent animal case law to work off of, do you have any advice for how to kind of make something out of nothing in a sense? Yeah, that's a... That's a Good question, and I understand your pain. Um, I initially tried to stay within the animal law field, and so I started reading case law from other states. Um, Oregon had a, a really good case, actually, but I recognized that trying to sell my argument based on a um, Oregon Supreme Court case probably wouldn't hold much sway in Ohio and so that's when I decided to look outside of animal law and focused on cases that had nothing to do with animal law and realized like well we could use those to uh, interpret statutes in a way or it I actually think that I found a better argument when I stopped reading the animal law cases specifically but I still stayed within my state because your argument obviously is stronger if you have um, you know, a higher court in your own jurisdiction. Yeah, I think that's great advice to be creative, right? And try to work a, an opinion in a way that it wasn't necessarily intended to be. So I think that's great. Um, any other questions out there? Oh, I see your hand. You're the question, you're like the free <laughs> FAQ. <laughs> no, no, please, please, please. That is a very good question. Um, I looked more at the industry standards and corporations that have inflicted damage on birds in that respect. Uh, one of them actually was with, in, in wind turbine cases. We had Duke Energy and Pacific Corp, who were both indicted through, through the MBTA based on their damage of birds, even though it wasn't their intention. But uh, as far as civilians, it's much more difficult because then you would have the argument that every time you hit a bird with a car, that's a violation. Every time your cat kills a bird, that's a violation. And that's an argument that both the Eighth and Ninth Circuit have brought in, and the Fifth, saying that we can make this way too broad and indict way too many people with violations in the civil system versus leaving it with the with the, with the industry. So that actually hasn't really come up in courts as much, just because it's deemed to be too broad and indicting way too many people. Does that answer your question? Well, it sounds like you guys are going to have to follow this conversation <laughs> up later in your networking. <laughs> okay, any other questions out there? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
So I'll just repeat that for everyone. So the question was about um, class actions having to do with puppy mills, and if you were, when we are to prevail on these, um, do we think that'll have a you know positive impact in terms of potentially shutting down other ones that weren't named in the lawsuit? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it would definitely have a positive impact, particularly if you know it was one of these major pet stores like Petland that is sourcing dogs from puppy mills. If they had an adverse judgment against them in a class action, given they're sort of nationally based, you'd think it would make them think twice about their practices all over the country, given that you know they've been found liable once. They'd very much be concerned about having class actions filed in other states and going through the same thing. So I think it could have a really broad-reaching impact. I think in terms of shutting down puppy mills, I think that's probably too optimistic given they are so pervasive and they're so present in so many in, in, in every state and you know um very hard to enforce but i think if we started to see more and more judgments shutting these things down it would at least stop pet stores from sourcing their dogs from these places because they'd be concerned about the liability so i think there's definitely potential there yeah and of course i would think yes if you are able to cut out that financial incentive then the puppy mills you don't necessarily have to shut them down because if they can't make money off it, they're not going to do it. So I think it's that can be a very good way to get at them indirectly. Okay, well, I want to thank um, Spring, Tess, and Mary for all your hard work um, and for taking the time to present to us today.